And we are back. So up next is James Hudges uh, with the state of uh, GeoMesa. Hello, Jim. You're muted. So uh, just this. Yep. Hello. <laughs> Just a short introduction to, to Jim. Jim applies training in mathematics and computer science to build distributed scalable systems capable of the, uh, supporting data science and machine learning. He's a core committer of, for GeoMesa, which leverages HBase, Accumulo, and other distributed database systems to provide distributed computation and query capabilities. He's also a committer for the Location Tech Project JTS and SF Curve and uh, serves a mentor for other Location Tech and Eclipse project. Uh, Jim serves on the Location Tech project uh, management committee and steering committee. Through work with Location Tech and, and OSGEO project like GeoTools and GeoServer, he works to build end-to-end -end solutions for big spatiotemporal temporal problems. Uh, Jim received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Virginia for work studying al al algebraic uh, topology. He enjoys playing outdoors and swing dancing. So, yeah. Thank you, Jim, for joining us. And the floor is yours. Great. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, for those who have been uh, following GeoMesa, this is the first time at uh, Phosphor G. We've had a uh, state of uh, GMESA talk. So uh, since um, not everyone may be familiar with GMESA, the first thing I want to do is start with a, you know, the very brief overview slides. Uh, so if you've uh, joined this talk and uh, you, you're not familiar with GMESA, we'll orient things at a very, very high level first. So, um, oh, on my slides, give me one sec. Oh, there they go. Um, so uh, they weren't advancing for a second, at least uh, with what I was seeing. So, um, so GeoMesa is a suite of tools for streaming, persisting, managing, and analyzing spatial temporal data at scale. Uh, we'll take each of those uh, in turn here in a moment and chat through them. And then we'll get into uh, what we've been doing lately over the last uh, year or more in GeoMesa and talk about uh, new features that have come out in the GeoMesa 3X um, series. So the first thing that, um, the first of those four pillars to talk about is, um, okay, there we go. The first of those four pillars to talk about is streaming. So GMAs integrates with Apache uh, Kafka for uh, message transportation. And we don't have as much uh, open source on the streaming analytics side. Uh, that's uh, really where the state of the art is. And uh, over the years, we've worked with various technologies like Storm and like City, and we're starting to look at what we can do with uh, Kafka Streams and also KSQL DB uh, to do geospatial. Uh, I've got to talk tomorrow morning about some more going into the details about uh, streaming. So. Um, the next pillar is big data persistence. And uh, there's also a talk this afternoon uh, where my coworker Emilio and I will talk about uh, this top row is all databases. Uh, so GMAs has started on Accumulo. The bottom row is getting to uh, be how we can do, G do what we do uh, with data lakes and uh, big data file formats. And so we'll dive into those details and uh, provide a little bit of a discussion about um, when you should choose a database and when you should choose uh, um, a data lake, uh, what the differences between those buzzwords are and things like that. Um, so since we've got data that could be going to a big database like uh, Apache HBase or Cumulo, it could also be written to uh, files in S3 and it could be streamed in Kafka. The next pillar that we have is needing to manage uh, data in the enterprise. And there's a project called Apache NiFi that helps do this really well. Um, if you only had to move one data type around and stream it through your system, writing any old application would be fine. If you needed to do multiple uh, streams, you would want to start to build uh, reusable components that would have insights like data provenance and also do other uh, things. So Apache NiFi does this for us. And uh, the only thing we have to do is the GMASA product. 
uh, project team is add in capabilities to write out to GeoTools data stores. So you could put data in post-GIS or put it in uh, various GeoMesa components. And so that gives you a strong way to kind of put things together. Uh, so it is that ETL glue that comes up. One of the things that people are interested in when they have big geospatial data is analyzing it in Spark jobs and MapReduce jobs. And GeoMesa integrates with uh, those. We've got some integrations with uh, Spark's SQL uh, query engine to teach it uh, everything that PostGIS knows about points, lines, and polygons. And then there's some optimizations there. So again, this is just your 100,000 foot overview of what GeoMesa is. Uh, a potential way you would put all this together is as data comes in on the left, you would use Apache NiFi and some of the GeoMesa converters to uh, turn the data into simple features. Um, that's the OGC standard uh, to represent um, just you know, uh, geographical data, geographical vector data. And then you could stream it across the top uh, using Kafka, or you could write it to, again, those big distributed databases or S3 along the bottom. Um, I'm uh, humbled to be speaking after state of GeoServer. GeoServer lets us serve up all that data um, in an OGC manner uh, from either Kafka or the big data databases. Um, that integration has uh, worked and is fantastic. We won't talk too much about GeoServer, but know that everything you can do with GeoServer with PostGIS, uh, most of those tricks work with everything we're talking about here, even though we're not like focusing on that. So um, if you're like really trying to get a sense of what's going on, uh, we're trying to solve those, uh, you know, V's from big data uh, from that buzzword a few years ago uh, and uh, enable that through GeoServer and other capabilities like Spark. So we're gonna go back in time to July, 2020, uh, since we, you know, uh, because of the pandemic, haven't had some of these chances to talk about uh, new things. And this is just kind of a feature frenzy uh, chat through uh, what's been new in GeoMesa recently. And we're gonna hit the highlights. We may not talk about every particular thing. So there are uh, other version upgrades that happened in GeoMesa 3.0 and other uh, benefits you'd get uh, with that. But one of the big things to talk about in GeoMesa 3.0 is that we added Accumulo 2 support. And Accumulo is a distributed database, uh, just like Apache HBase. And what this means is you need to have distributed storage uh, for them. So most databases just have local files that they access, Accumulo and HBase, uh, read files from something like HDFS, or uh, HBase has had support for using cloud storage like AWS's S3 or Azure's uh, blob storage. Uh, those have worked with HBase for a few years now. And so since Accumulo and HBase are pretty similar, people have asked the question, hey, uh, what would it take to get Accumulo to support it? That finally came in Accumulo 2.0. The big uh, thing that that lets you do is it lets you decouple um, the attached storage that you would otherwise have to have attached to an EC2 instance, you can use S3 and scale you know, as much as you want. You can separate that out from the compute. Um, a normal Accumulo instance, if you needed terabytes of storage, you would have wound up uh, attaching more and more. If you need terabytes and petabytes, you would have bought more and more EC2 instances because EC2 instances have a limit of how much storage they can have attached in their you know, EBS volumes. Um, so you drove up compute costs as you were attaching more expensive storage. So uh, yeah, this is definitely, if you're on Accumulo and doing things in the public cloud, this is a massive uh, uh, cost saver there. So I talked a little bit about Apache NiFi and in the GeoMesa 3 series, we um, have worked with Apache NiFi a lot to um, evolve the way that we do our integration there. So since, um, again, first time we're talking about state of GMESA, um, you know, we've given other intro talks about it. We've talked about uh, what GMESA can do with NIFI at other Phosphor G events. Um, I don't assume everyone knows what NIFI is. So 
uh, this is just from their, uh, you know, uh, like literally from their homepage. And so it says Apache supports, um, you know, scalable uh, directed graphs of data routing, and you can do transformations and system mediation logic. And some of the really high level things that this can do is it's got a web-based interface and so now the thing you've got is instead of needing to write XML or some other configuration language to hook up things in your um, data enterprise, you can just use a web-based interface. And it's a drag and drop kind of programming thing. So uh, if you've seen those things that they use to teach kids how to program like Scratch uh, or other uh, web GUIs for just seeing data flow around, uh, maybe FME, for instance. Um, it's going to have that same sort of feel to it. So it is incredibly configurable. And one of the other things you can do is you can see uh, how data flows through the system. And that can be important to help debug things or just know what's going on. Lastly, it's designed for extensions. So everything we're going to talk about next is going to get into some of those extensions. OK, yeah, so yeah, extensions. Uh, okay, so we use it for managing data flows, and uh, this lets us do that typical ETL uh, that you might need to uh, work through um, in an environment. So just as a really like concrete uh, example, uh, we could be using a processor called Git HTTP or Listen TCP, and that would let us get data into the system from uh, those sources. You can transform the data. Uh, there are records, there, there are processors that let you pro, uh, transform it record by record. If you've got JSON, there's also one, the transform XML, uh, that lets you write uh, XSLT uh, to do whatever it is you need to do there. Once you've changed the data around, you can also, or created it, done whatever uh, is happening, you can also write it out to a traditional database or send it to S3, for instance. So. That lets you do, uh, like I said, your basic ETL uh, things. So let's talk about some of the processors we have in GeoMesa. Uh, not all of these are new in uh, GeoMesa 3. Uh, this first one is, um, so GeoMesa, like I said, uses Kafka for streaming. Um, we've had to figure out how to send simple features over Kafka topics. GeoMesa has its own internal uh, serialization format for that. So rather than sending uh, Avro or JSON, we send uh, records packed up in cryo, for better or worse. We've got a processor that will read that cryo and turn it into um, NiFi records. NiFi has a pluggable record reader API that will let you write out CSV and JSON and XML. And so at that point, uh, you can take that otherwise uh, really general or really specific uh, GeoMesa format and you can turn it into whatever format you want to process in the rest of your NiFi flow or the rest of your enterprise. So we also have a GeoMesa converter library that helps us uh, map whatever input data you have into simple features. And this is an example of one of the transformations we support where you can use those converter uh, definitions and libraries and code to turn in uh, turn whatever comes into it into uh, GeoAvro. Uh, so that's a GeoMesa, uh, uh, you know, sort of modified uh, Avro file format to represent simple features in Avro. So we also have processors that help us put uh, data directly into a backend like HBase. So we've got these for each of the backends. Uh, rather than show you each of them, I've just you know put two of them up here. And in addition to that, for every backend data store that you would want to write to. Uh, we have an ability to have a configuration service for it uh, that was added in uh, more recently in uh, GMASA 3.3. Those configuration services uh, let you define the definition once of what you're writing to. And then if you had multiple processors that were all writing to the same database, you'd be able to reuse that uh, configuration. So it's a kind of those configuration services help centralize and help do configuration management. I mentioned before that NiFi lets you write out records in CSV and XML and JSON. Uh, that idea is pluggable. And we also uh, have provided a GeoAvro record set reader. So if you want to write your data out into GeoAvro, you can do that. 
One of the reasons the Avro file format is interesting is it works well with um, you know, some things like MapReduce. And um, you know, it, it's just another alternative. Uh, everyone needs more options for how to write out their uh, data, right? So, um, so that was some of the stuff that uh, kind of wanted to focus on from GMA, so 3.0 and 3.1. In 3.2, uh, we've got another handful of things that we'll uh, chat about. In GeoMesa NiFi, we've added support for modifying rights. And so this is where, and I'm really talking about this processor on the right, we have an ability to update data that's in a backend like Accumula or HBase. And uh, that lets us do a quick little update and say, I mean, we can look up the record by something like feature ID and then uh, replace it in the database. Um, in big data, we don't do too much uh, updating of data, uh, but that's uh, an option with this uh, processor. So that's great to see that support. One of the things that was a big deal in GMASA 3.2 is we added support for Spark 3. Um, Scala and Spark are kind of lined up together with, um, you know, Spark has a default version of Scala that it wants to use and it's compiled for. So if someone just says, I'm using Spark 2.3 or 2.4, um, unless they've gone to trouble, it's compiled against Scala 2.11. And Spark 3, that's against Scala 2.12. So in adding uh, Spark 3 support, we've added Scala 2.12 to the build. And this means that we have to create two copies of every artifact. So those uh, Scala versions wind up in most all of the jars. You know, you'll see that somewhere in the jar. And um, yeah, so this is just uh, a little table showing how we're, you know, working through the details there of adding support for uh, the next um, uh, thing and how we step through that. Um, so whenever we talk about GMA Sephora, we'll drop that Scala 211 support. That also means that Spark 2x support will go away. So one of the things that Kafka has added over time is the ability to do uh, transactional writes. And we've integrated with Kafka <laughs> since uh, you know, 0, 08, and they're up to you know, Kafka 2.8. And they're talking about, hey, what's going to be in Kafka 3 and Kafka 4? Uh, so it's great that we've added, uh, been able to pick up this uh, transactional write. Um, the little code sample on the right uh, shows some of the details there. We hook into the GeoTools transaction um, uh, lifecycle. And so we can actually use it to help manage uh, the you know, transactions in Kafka. So a lot of times we've ignored those sort of transaction ACID sort of things since a lot of the databases we work with don't support ACID directly. But since Kafka now has uh, transactions, we're hooking up to that here. Uh, so that's a really cool, uh, nice little add. One of the other things to think through, uh, the Kafka data store reads a large volume of data. Um, you know, a Kafka, the Kafka data store reads through a large volume of data from a Kafka topic in order to get ready sometimes. So we've added this a little bit of a readiness check to make sure that uh, we know if um, all the data has been read. So we've got a... Uh, it's a little bit of, it's got two pieces to it. Uh, we've got a little bit of extra code in a project called GeoMesa GeoServer. If you drop that in, uh, all the Kafka data stores, whenever you start up GeoServer, they'll start reading from Kafka and they'll know they've got a way to poke uh, GeoMesa and know if all the data is ready. And that's provided out on a small little REST endpoint. And this lets you, uh, you know, check GeoServer from your like Kubernetes environment and ask the question, hey, has my GeoServer read all the data? That's important because if it, when it hasn't, if you make a WMS request or a WFS request, you may only see part of the live picture that you're otherwise trying to see. And people will be like, where are all the things that we're tracking and, and monitoring? And they just won't be there. Uh, so this is a win for that, uh, you know, cloud environment kind of uh, setup. All right, so let's talk about 3.3 uh, three real quick. Um, in NiFi, uh, we've added support for PostGIS. Uh, in um, 
uh, with the Kafka integration, we've added the ability to uh, pull in the same layer and um, view it multiple ways. This is kind of like having an SQL view in GeoServer. So uh, we've had to do that kind of a layer down. It's uh, a nice little uh, thing there. Um, we've added bulk ingest into Accumulo. We've previously done this with HBase. The problem with either of these databases is uh, normally what would happen is as you're writing uh, using typical write methods, you'd fill up um, memory on each of the um, you know, servers that make up the distributed databases. They would write out smaller compactions that could be a few hundred megabytes, and that would lead to a you know uh, an acceptably quick uh, ingest rate. But you know, with MapReduce, you can build up these files much quicker. So that can be faster than a traditional ingest. It's a, a pretty cool, pretty complicated feature. Um, since we're increasingly seeing situations where people uh, want to use uh, all the sort of different storage options they have, um, people will have smaller amounts of data uh, that make sense to store just in PostGIS. So in NiFi, we've figured out um, we're using some of the um, you know, same put uh, capabilities that we have to write directly to PostGIS. And so now in NiFi, you can choose, OK, I'm going to use PostGIS, or I'm going to use S3, or HBase, or Kafka. And so it helps kind of put all that together. Um, I want to talk for a moment or two as we uh, wrap some of this up uh, about um, what's going to come in sort of the next few releases. And in a 3.4 or a 4.0, um, we actually have a PR, and we have some interest in, um, from a few different places, integration with Apache Sedona. So um, GeoMesa started out on Accumulo, and we've grown from there. So after you had a bunch of data in Accumulo, someone would ask the question, how do you take that data in Accumulo and see a live view? That's where we added Kafka. And you could also say, I've got that data in Accumulo. How do I you know, analyze it? And that's where we added Spark. Apache Sedona grew out of a research project um, from some grad students where they started uh, uh, in another corner of uh, the problem space and said, I have Apache Spark. How do I do geospatial with it? Since they started there with a much more modest uh, and direct question, their focus was on geospatial joins. And GeoMesa hasn't had to fight those battles quite as much. Um, there's actually a few different ways GeoMesa and Sedona can integrate. And we mentioned it. We discussed those actually on Gitter. This is an example of open source community working. Uh, we you know, had a power user uh, ask some questions about, how do I do joins? And I said, hey, uh, GeoMesa and Sedona should be able to work together. We've actually got an MR or PR up for that that we're uh, working through. So that's really cool. Um, so there's more. Uh, discussion that can be had about that. Um, as we talk about GMA Sephora, there are two um, things that we would do in that major release. We've deprecated a few uh, specific modules um, because people didn't seem to be using them. So if you're interested in uh, Kudu or Camel or what we had done with GMA so Web and GMA so G uh, GeoJSON, uh, let us know. Um, we can uh, chat more about that instead of removing them in 4.0. 4.0 is also where we're going to add um, support for Java 11. Um, for better or worse, GMESA is one of the, since it's at the corner of big data with a bunch of Apache projects and uh, GeoTools and GeoServer, we have to wait for a lot of the open source ecosystem to <laughs> update to Java 11. Uh, the Hadoop side of the house has been slower than GeoTools and GeoServer. Uh, I'm, I'm proud that that community was able to knock that out like late in 2018, and I was happy to help with that project. We've got a few split packages that we haven't uh, sorted out, so we need to do that so that things will work. And then for every backend that we integrate with, the four or five of them, we'll need to test them, uh, check things out, and see what versions we can support. Um, and then also CI CD to do whatever cross building is appropriate. All right. So that's a good place to um, stop and take some questions. Um, you know, just to say it out loud, CCRI is hiring. So if you're uh, US based, uh, uh, feel free to reach out to me. And yeah.
Thank you, Jim. So yeah. there are some questions from the audience. Great. Uh, this is the first one. Yesterday I heard about Apache Sedona. What is the difference between GeoMesa and Sedona? And why shall I use GeoMesa instead of Sedona? Mm. Yeah. Um, from my point of view, uh, the it's a question of if you were going to write down your architecture diagram and explain it to someone in, um, you know, kind of those big fuzzy bricks. If if the whole picture was going to be, I'm going to draw Spark and say I'm going to do all my geospatial processing in Spark, absolutely use Sedona. Um, if you started to say, oh, I need a live layer, so I'm going to use Kafka, and oh, I've got a lot of data, so I'm interested in, you know using HBase, um, then you, you need more components. GMASA integrates with a lot of things. So it's a breadth versus depth kind of thing. So if you're, if you if the challenges you have, um, I mean, it, it feels weird to go back to it, but uh, five years ago, there was a, 10 years ago, there was a, a big data is about uh, these three Vs or five Vs or how many ever Vs, people kept coming up with words that start in English with the letter V where they say big data is about velocity, variety, and volume. If you've got that volume and you've also got velocity and variety problems, GMASA may have uh, more tools that'll help you with that. Uh, Sedona is really focused on geospatial joins. Thank you. Uh, another question. How similar are GeoMesa and GeoWave today? What would be the Ooh. biggest difference? Um, I haven't kept up with uh, GeoWave precisely. Um, I'm, I'm in their Gitter. I haven't seen as much traffic there. Um, so I can't speak to some of the differences. Uh, GeoMesa and GeoWave started at about the same time. And we started from the same place where uh, both projects needed to do big data persistence using Accumulo. And there were a lot of similar evolutions we took where if you can do that on Accumulo, you do it on HBase. And um, so there's a lot of places where we've uh, done a lot of similar work. I think GeoMesa has done more with streaming and data management with NiFi. Uh, in fairness to GeoWave, they've uh, built out more tools that would like REST APIs for managing things. So um, I think it's a tough uh, question of what you would have to compare. Uh, I'm always happy to, if people want to have a quick conversation about what GMAs can do for them, they can just send me an email. Uh, we're also very active on Gitter. So um, I think it comes down to a question of, I mean, it's a similar question to, um, do I use GeoServer or do I use MapServer? Right. OK, thanks. Uh, next question. Maybe we have time for this one. Does GeoMesa have a Python API, particularly to be able to use it uh, in a PySpark application? The answer is uh, yes, we have a little bit of one. Um, the challenge that we have, and um, um, I, I definitely want to be able, I want that GMASA can support uh, data scientists who are very familiar with Python and everything works uh, from a PySpark uh, environment. The context that I want to give for this is the challenge with this is all the back end things that are going to actually happen with the data are happening on the JVM. And so it's like you're building a ship in a bottle uh, whenever you're going through Python. Uh, because the, there's a, uh, the neck of the bottle, if you were making a ship in a bottle, uh, that is the Python to uh, JVM bridge. So everything you would do in Python needs to you know, go move the ship inside of the bottle, uh, so to speak. And getting those bindings perfect is challenging. Um, I've had a coworker uh, and uh, other member of, this, uh, of the Phosphor-G OSGO community, uh, Tom Kanicki, who uh, got some of that work started. So we do have a little bit there. Um, it is good for some things. Not everything is done with it. Um, Apache Sedona has focused on that a little bit more. So one of the things that I'm hoping is that as we integrate with Sedona, that where we have a 50% solution or an 80% solution, we might be able to get up to 90, 95% 
uh, by putting that together. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. We are out of time. Thank you very much, Jim, for the presentation and for answering all the questions. Yeah, those were great questions. Thanks for hosting. And uh, yeah. See you soon. See you.